Welcome to the lecture review on the Guide to Computer Forensics and Investigations, 5th edition. Here we're looking at the last chapter in this book, which is chapter 16, Ethics for the Expert Witness. Our objectives for this is to explain how ethics and codes apply to expert witnesses, explain how other organizations' codes of ethics apply to expert testimony, describe ethical uh, difficulties in expert testimonies, and explain the process of carving data manually. I'm not quite sure why that's here, but it is. So, ethics are the rules you internalize and use to measure your performance. That's one very broad definition of ethics. Uh, there are codes for professionals that conduct themselves. Uh, again, professionally and responsibility. Uh, these standards that apply to others uh, and to you so that you're compelled to adhere by those external forces. Um, if you're a lawyer, you have a licensing body. If you're a doctor, you have a licensing body. If you're a cosmopolitan or a, hair, a hairstylist, again, you have a licensing body. Most organizations, uh, most professional groups have some form of licensing body. They enforce a certain set of like a code of conduct. That way people follow what rule the, that group or that body has says is important to follow. People need ethics to help maintain their balance. Again, that's super subjective. It's about being able to self-respect and respect uh, for their professions. Again, super subjective. Ethics are pretty much how you make sure that you're doing right. There are laws that govern code of professional conduct or responsibilities. These will define the lowest level of action or performance required to avoid any form of liability. I'm sorry, not to avoid liability, but to help mitigate your liability. Because you don't really avoid liability, you deal with it and you mitigate it. Uh, that mitigation deals with kind of pushing some of it off of you if you... Uh, do certain things legally legally expert witnesses should uh should represent an unbiased view in their area of special uh expertise whether it be uh forensics or other technical uh, areas part of this is the portray of or how they portray evidence to a jury assuming you're working with a jury you control your bias. You don't allow them to control you. Again, it's more about having your opinion and having your findings backed by supportive data. Expert witnesses testify in more than 80% of trials and many trials. There are multiple expert witnesses that will testify. The most important laws applying to the attorney and witnesses are the rules of evidence. Actually, if you've ever gone through law school, you have a course just on rules of evidence, and it's a pretty uh, hefty course. Experts are bound by their own personal ethics and the ethics of their professional organizations, assuming that they have any. In the U.S., there is no state or national uh, licensing body for digital forensics examiners yet. Your source of ethics, uh, ethical standards are your internal values and the code of professional associations you belong to, again, assuming that you belong to any. Digital forensics examiners have two roles, facts uh, witnessing and expert witnessing. As an expert witness, you can testify even if you weren't present when the event occurred or didn't handle any of the data structure. That's going to be more of a fact to witness. Uh, the criticism here is it's possible to find and hire an expert to testify to almost any opinion to any topic. Part of that is going to be more of the attorney opinion shopping. Uh, we talked about that kind of in chapter 14 a, a little bit. One of the effects of violating court rules or laws is disqualification. Just because you're an expert witness doesn't mean that the court has to recognize you. Or, if you piss off the court, they kick you out and you're disqualified from returning as an expert witness. Opposing counsels might attempt to disqualify you 
based on deviations from opinions you've given in previous cases. Again, in chapter 14, we, uh, we talked about the structure of writing a report. That way, you have to list all of the cases you've worked on and the opinions that were given. Some attorneys' uh, contacts may uh, many expert witnesses as a ploy to disqualify them. That, again, is more subjective, but it is feasible. Or to prevent opposing counsels from hiring them. Because if you're the only expert area, the only expert witness in your area, you cannot testify both for the prosecutor and for the defense. Determining who the parties are to reduce the possibilities of a conflict is kind of important because you're not supposed to be able to testify in a case that you actually have a conflict in. Whenever you're aware of a possibility disqualification issue, you're supposed to bring it to the attention of the attorney who's retained you. Factors for disqualifying you as an expert include whether the attorney has informed the expert that there are discussions were confidential, whether the expert reviewed materials marked as confidential or attorney work product, or whether the expert has asked to sign a confidentiality agreement. Those are all areas that may disqualify an expert. Factors to disqualify an expert uh, also number of discussions held over a period of time, the types of uh, documents and information, the amount of time involved, whether the experts provided the attorney with confidential information, whether the attorney formally has retained the expert to begin with, whether the experts voice concerns about being retained, whether the expert has requested to perform services for the attorney. Lastly, whether the attorney has compensated the expert. All of this, you have to make sure that you are following the appropriate rules, laws, regulations for your state, your region, and your country. So that leads into traps. Be cautious about the following potential traps. What are some of the uh, differences between the attorney's uh, motives and the investigative duties? Is there a function of the expert witness in conflict with the investigator's code of professional responsibility? You should anticipate that the opposing counsel will look at your organizational membership and those organization codes of professional responsibilities and verify that you're meeting them. Contingency fees that aren't followed except in certain limited circumstances. Again, how you're being paid is important. Avoid obvious ethical errors. Don't represent false data or alter data. Report works that was not done. Ignore available uh, contradictory data. Do not work beyond your expertise or competency. Don't allow the attorney who retained you to influence your opinion in any in an unauthorized fashion. Don't accept assignments if you can't reasonably be done in the allowed time. Don't reach a conclusion before you've completed the work. Don't fail to report possible conflicts of interest. Because there's a lot of rules within the admission of evidence, we have to be very careful with how we structure things. Hypothetical questions can give you the factual structure to support and defend your opinion. Though you may want to avoid hypothetical questions, you may want to base your opinions based off solely off of factual data. Although experts' opinions can be presented without stating the underlying factual basis, it's important that you have it. The testimony isn't admissible if the facts on which the opinion is based is not inadequate, or there's insufficient evidence to allow stating a legitimate opinion. The sky is blue because in the day, today, um, when I looked up, the sky was blue. That is not sufficient evidence to make the claim that the sky is blue. We have to make sure that we have the appropriate uh, 
uh, amount of data collected and that it's legitimate and is supported to support my claim that the sky is blue. It may seem kind of ridiculous, but when you start doing higher level writing, this is something that's expected. No single source offered a definitive code of ethics for witnesses, so you must draw on standards from other organizations to form your own ethical standards and your own moral structure. Many organizations have rules to kind of guide their members, but it's based off of what organizations you are part of. There is part of the International Society for Forensics Computer Examiners, the ISFCE. They include a guideline as to follow, but again, it is not required within the United States. Things like testifying truthfully, avoiding any actions that would appear to be in conflict of interest, uh, misrepresenting training, credentials, or the associated memberships, revealing any of confidential material or knowledge learned in an examination in order to form a court or jurisdiction of the client express permissions uh, without the appropriate permissions. Uh, we also have the International High Technology Crime Investigation Association, the HTCIA. Again, they have their own core values about truth and covering uh, with digital information, effective techniques, things of that. Again, they're, all of this is based off of the code of ethics that you're going to be uh, looking at adhering to. We also have the International Association for Computer Investigation Specialists, IACIS, and again, it's about maintaining the ob objectivity, it's about being able to thoroughly examine and analyze evidence, and portraying the evidence that you're collecting in a truthful manner. Uh, in America, we have the American Bar Association, which have very specific codes of, uh, co uh, codes of ethics and codes of responsibilities for lawyers. Each state has, again, their own bar. There is also the appropriate uh, APA, the American Psychological Association. And this is more of code of conduct, but this is also for structured writing. We also have eth uh, ethical difficulties in expert testimony, because this is where it gets kind of uh, more gray. They are inherent to conflicts between the goals of the attorneys and the goal of scientists or technicians, experts, may conflict with attorneys. Attorneys work in a adversarial system and look to sway judges and juries, where within science we're required to focus on evidence without the influence of other obje uh, objects. Again, it focuses on facts. It's about being able to enforce the appropriate guidelines and ethics in difficult situations. Again, assuming that you apply or that you're part of certain members that require these uh, organizational guidelines, not every individual is. It's about available guidelines set the minimum acceptable performance and how do you relate to them. You ever hear like a sleazy lawyer they may follow the rules, but they don't follow the the heart of the rules. They may do things that a typical lawyer would not. Your attorney owes you a fair statement of case or situation, adequate time to review the appropriate evidence and prepare your report, a reasonable opportunity to examine data, conduct testing, investigate the matters before rendering an opinion, most attorneys, include opposing counsels, are uh, competent, courteous professionals. They don't have to be, though. Some opposing counsels attempt to make discovery depositions physically uncomfortable after noting a problem. You can refuse to continue with the deposition if necessary. As a measure of protection, you might want to have your personal attorney attend depositions, just in case. This attorney can't object to questions but is, avail is available to advise the attorneys who retain you to advise you during uh, certain breaks. 
Basically, they're there to protect you from you saying anything that you're not supposed to say, even to an attorney who has retained you. Standard and personal uh, created forensics tools. This gets really weird. Tools that you uh, recover, control, and track evidence are subject to review by opposing parties. Hence, the use the appropriate industry standard tools uh, that are approved. In case core discovery, FTK, access data, those are major brand tools that are recognized. Yes, you can create your own tools, but then they have to be vetted. By following the activities at the end of the chapter, we should be able to determine very specific things. Determining hexadecimal values from text strings, search Unicode data, carving data, uh, clusters manually. Again, all of this will be in a separate video as I do in the actual chapter reviews for the lab components. And that's the end of our book. End of the chapter and end of our book. Ethics are not this clearly defined. Ethics and morals are going to be based off of individuals, by society, by region, by country. You owe your client a full understanding of the facts relevant to your appropriate opinion. Be aware of the attempts to disqualify you. Be aware of obvious ethical errors. No single source, keep that in mind. Make sure that you understand the appropriate international bodies of ethics, even if they don't apply to you or don't apply within the United States. These may be codes, groups that you may want to look at so that you actually have a code of ethics or code of standards that you want to adhere to. Inherent conflict between the needs of the justice system and your obligation to your profession. And again, tools. Make sure you're using the appropriate tools uh, that are recognized by your industry. That's the end of our book. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.